tonight. A man accused of killing his wife's cousin three years ago in Warman has been found guilty of second-degree murder. Also, the mayor of Lalage travels to Regina to seek help from government leaders as the Northern Village's high school copes with more violence. And we as a community want to heal. We as a community want to move forward. We as a community want an excellent quality of life. Plus, James Smith Cree Nation continues to grapple with what to do with more than half a million dollars in donations, more than six months after the mass stabbing attack. This is CBC Saskatchewan News. It is Tuesday, April 25th, and the CBC Saskatchewan News starts right now. Good evening and thank you for joining us. It's been nearly three years since a 23-year-old woman was strangled to death in Warman. Salmon Deep Ginger's body was found bound and hidden away in the basement of a home. Today, the woman's killer was convicted of murder. Jason Warwick reports. A court of King's Bench judge has ruled Ranbir Dull killed his estranged wife's cousin, Salmon Deep Ginger, in 2020. Ginger's body was found strangled and bound in the basement of the wife's home. Her wrists were bound together, her knees were bound together, and her wrists were bound to her knees. Her mouth and nose were covered with tape, uh, and two items of clothing were used to strangle her to death. Dahl had asked a fellow taxi driver help dispose of Ginger's body, but the man called police. Police discovered her body shortly after. The motive for the murder is unclear. The woman had moved to Warman just a few months earlier to help take care of the family's children. Crown Prosecutor Tyla Olenchuk says Ginger will be dearly missed by her extended family. This was a senseless killing of a young woman who was trying to help her cousin raise her children. From the outset, it was apparent to the Crown that Mr. Duell was guilty of this offence. Justice Richard Daniluk declined to convict Dahl of the more serious offence of first-degree murder. Daniluk said the Crown failed to prove Ginger was bound and confined before the killing, and it's possible it was done after the woman died. Dahl will receive an automatic life sentence, but the hearing to determine his date of parole eligibility takes place in June. Jason Warwick, CBC News, Saskatoon. A judge has sentenced Dylan Whitehawk to life in prison with no chance of parole for 25 years. He's the third person to be sentenced in the murder of Regina mother Keisha Bitternose. The 29-year-old woman suffered a gruesome gang-related death in January of 2020. Two people were sentenced for manslaughter last year, and today the third, Dylan Whitehawk, was given the maximum sentence for second-degree murder. The Crown was seeking a first-degree murder conviction and says it still hopes to appeal. For now, Better Knows's family say they plan to begin their healing process. The mayor of Laloche was in Regina today to speak with the provincial government about school violence and community trauma. The Northern Village's high school is closed this week after a stabbing last Thursday. It's the same high school that had a mass shooting several years ago. Sam Sampson has more on what the mayor is asking for. This is supposed to be a place of opportunity in Laloche, but this week classes are cancelled and this is now an emergency counselling clinic a place for students, their families, and staff members to process their feelings about a violent attack last week. Two people were attacked Thursday on school grounds. The town's mayor says a student and a teacher's aide were stabbed. She says both are recovering from their injuries. The mayor says a student is in custody in relation to the attack. The community is, yes, they're afraid, they're scared, the trauma. We get, many families are reliving the traumas. This latest attack has brought up memories of 2016, when a teenager opened fire in the school, killing two staff members and hurting seven others. The trauma from that still remains, community members say, in the form of students afraid to go to school, drug use and gang membership. We as a community want to move forward. We as a community want an excellent quality of life. And so that's where we need the assistance. While the school is shut down for the week to develop a safety plan, Laloche Mayor Georgina Jollibois met with provincial ministers in Regina. She wants help addressing this latest attack and creating a healthier Dene community. The status quo does not work in provincial ministries as well as federal ministries. It's not reaching the Dene kids, the Dene families, the Dene elders and the community itself. 
Jolly Boss says the village has been working on a community safety plan for months. It involves the school, the RCMP, and different provincial groups like the Saskatchewan Health Authority. The province says it's helped Lalash since 2016 and will continue to do so. It's not dollar resources because the dollars are there for the most part. It's human resources, making sure we have people to fill those uh, needed uh, positions in hard to recruit communities at times. Jolly Bois hopes to hear from ministers within 10 days about what could be done to help her community. A quick timeline, but an urgent one. She says the young people can't wait. Sam Sampson, CBC News, Regina. Public Safety Minister Marco Mendocino appeared today before a House of Commons committee looking at pending firearms legislation. The Liberals introduced amendments that would list banned models, but in February they backtracked in response to criticism from firearms owners. Marina von Stackelberg has more on proceedings intended to improve the bill. Bill C-21, Mr. Chair, is the strongest gun reform legislation this country has seen in a generation. Public Safety Minister Marco Mendicino making his case once again for his gun control law at a House of Commons committee. The legislation would put a national freeze on handguns and raise maximum sentences for gun traffickers. We're committed to getting this right and getting this legislation passed for all Canadians. The Liberals withdrew amendments in February. They were criticized for not properly consulting with gun owners and publishing a list of prohibited firearms that included a number of long guns widely used by hunters. Minister, it's um, been a while that we've been waiting for you to come to this committee for these consultations. The Conservatives accused the Liberals of virtue signaling. Bans don't seem to be working, Minister. How do you think this new so-called ban on so-called assault-style firearms is going to be any different? Calling a national ban on assault-style firearms virtue signaling completely misses the mark and is disrespectful to every Canadian who has lost a loved one as a result of those firearms. What is disrespectful to Canadians is putting forward divisive political policies that are only designed to help the Liberal Party win elections instead of policies that will actually combat violent crime in our communities. The NDP support the handgun ban but want amendments to target the makers of guns. Leader Jagmeet Singh says that way they can't use loopholes to get around gun bans. It's going to go after the manufacturers that continue to change model numbers and change minor definitions of their of their weapons to get around and to skirt laws. That's an amendment the public safety minister says he is open to. Suspended. Marina von Stackelberg, CBC News, Ottawa. Tens of thousands of federal public workers are on strike for a seventh day as their union, the Public Service Alliance of Canada, continues to negotiate with Ottawa. Today, the union made good on ramping up picket lines in strategic locations, limiting access to some office buildings. Hundreds marched between Gatineau and Ottawa today, disrupting traffic for a while. Key issues for the union are higher wages, remote work and job security. Several government services have been impacted by the strike, including tax returns. There are growing calls for Sunday's tax deadline to be extended in light of the labour action. Oh, it was quite the sight over the weekend in parts of North America. The northern lights were visible across wide swaths of the continent, including here in Saskatchewan. This is the view from Minnesota. The dancing sky is the result of electrons colliding with the upper reaches of the Earth's atmosphere. We'll be back after the break. This weather update is brought to you by Mercedes-Benz Regina. Proud member of the Capital Automotive Group. Welcome back. Our weather specialist, Ethan Williams, joins me now. We finally get a nice day, but what is up with the wind? Yeah. Can we not just have a nice day? No, uh, we are always punished, it seems, <laughs> whether it's uh, we get warm air, maybe we need a little bit of rain or snow to go along with that. Uh, yes, we, we are definitely seeing some pretty strong winds, but again, a pretty nice afternoon in terms of temperatures. It was the race to 20 degrees in southwestern Saskatchewan this afternoon. Maple Creek getting to 19.5, not getting there if, unless you round it up, then I guess it is technically 20 degrees, but still not officially there. Leader is pretty close, though, uh, right behind at 19. And as you work your way northeast, of course, uh, temperatures a little bit cooler, but still not too bad sitting around the 10 degree mark uh, at this 6 o'clock hour. But of course, 
the wind has uh, been a big story these past couple of days and I think will continue to be. Uh, we had a gust close to 80 kilometers an hour in Lloyd Minster a little earlier this afternoon. Things have thankfully calmed down a bit. Uh, but all that wind is uh, thanks to a bit of a system that is moving into our province. Uh, a clipper from Alberta, which is bringing some rain right now, some heavier bands through northwestern Saskatchewan, and uh, even a few lightning strikes, some non-severe thunderstorms in southwestern Saskatchewan around the Swift Current area. And uh, that is still possible as we head through the night tonight in that area of the province. Uh, we are going to be seeing mostly rain on uh, the western side of Saskatchewan. That's going to be intensifying as we head through the evening tonight before almost the entirety of the province sees some rain getting closer to the midnight hour. And then as we head overnight, the system starts to uh, change a little bit. On the cold side of the system, behind the cold front, we're looking at some snow developing in portions of northern Saskatchewan. By tomorrow morning, though, the rain for south and central will start moving out. We're actually looking at not too bad of a day, a clearing day in south and central, but still a little bit of snow left behind in northern Saskatchewan before finally by the dinner hour tomorrow, the early evening hours, the system starts moving out. But then another system moves in, this one from southern Alberta, and this one will mostly be bringing rainfall to southwestern and south central Saskatchewan as we head into early Thursday morning. But just from this system, all of us through south and central looking for a good probably two to four millimeters. Uh, places north and east of Regina could get close to five, including around Yorkton. Regina, this might be a little bit of an overshoot, but still in that kind of two to four range. Again, mostly snow in the north. So five to ten centimeters possible wet snow mostly in an area from Cumberland House up to South End. And areas west of there, kind of in the western half of the region, looking for a good two to four millimeters, maybe close to five in some spots as well. But again, still breezy as we head through the night and as that system moves through tomorrow on the south side of it we'll get gusts close to 60 again especially in southeastern Saskatchewan as that next system moves its way through early Thursday morning there could be some gusts close to 50 in south central and southwestern sections. A Regina a lot of 12s on the board here uh, and we could be seeing a little bit of uh, morning rain of course tomorrow before that clears out then a little bit more cloud cover for Thursday on the back end of that system but sunshine and double digits after that. Saskatoon uh, very nice really right around season for this time of year for the next uh, few days here. Overnight lows even getting above the freezing mark. Talk about hitting your stride, Sam. That feels like spring. I'm so excited for the first smell of rain. I'm not even mad that it's going to rain. I know. It's such a great smell. So, oh, so purifying. So good. Thanks, Ethan. You bet. How do you make sure that all the family members of the deceased and the injured are supported equally? I thought we were making all efforts work in regards to trying help helping out to the, everybody that's reaching out. Still to come, almost eight months after the worst stabbing attack in Canadian history, James Smith Cree Nation is still grappling with what to do with more than half a million dollars in donations sent to the community after the tragedy. We'll have that story after the break. Stay with us. Survivors of last fall's stabbing rampage in James Smith Cree Nation say they're not getting the help they need. It's especially frustrating for them because hundreds of thousands of dollars in donations flowed into the community. As Olivia Stefanovic reports, they want answers and action. There's no escaping the grief. Burns Sr. died protecting his family during the worst mass stabbing in Canadian history. His father, now left behind, gives a final salute to his son, a veteran who would have turned 67 years old. We are celebrating my dad's first birthday without him. I just didn't want it to be a sad day for us because we celebrated his birthdays with him every year. Deborah Burns organized this round dance for her dad, one of 11 people whose lives were cut short last September in James Smith Cree Nation. They have each other, but many here say they're facing the aftermath alone. We feel ignored. Um, don't feel important to our chief and council because they refuse to talk with us. Yeah. Uh, or even refusing band meetings. She says her family hasn't received much support, 
despite more than half a million dollars sent to the Saskatchewan community in donations. It'd be really nice for them to come and come and see us on a daily and see what we're actually going through. Yeah, it would just be really nice to be acknowledged instead of feeling like we're being used. An outpouring of sympathy followed the tragedy. Corporations and private citizens sent James Smith more than $600,000. Over $125,000 raised through a GoFundMe campaign. Money that some community members want answers on how it's being used. We have never seen paper on who donated what, what they spent the donations on, who got what. We have no clue. Daryl Burns lost his sister Gloria in the attacks. He says the band paid for her funeral service and gave his family gift cards and checks to get by the first few months. But he doesn't know what's happening with the rest of the donations, and he wants to be consulted. Our chief runs under a cloak of secrecy. It's frustrating. And there's a lot of people in our community that are questioning all this stuff right now. For mental health and... Chief Wally Burns of James Smith Cree Nation says he's not hiding anything. Uh, he says leadership is grappling with how to spend all the donations it's received. How do you make sure that all the family members of the deceased and the injured are supported equally? I thought we were making all efforts work in regards to trying help, helping out to the, everybody that's reaching out. And I think, he uh, says James Smith went into debt after the massacre. It spent more than three and a half million dollars on hotels, travel and funerals. And just going back to we don't have no resources to, to help <clears throat> other programs. Because you had to pull money from different programs. Yeah. So that's not right. He says that left the community with tough choices. It used $200,000 from corporate and public donations to reimburse those costs. $300,000 worth of donations remain in the band's coffers with no plans on how to use the money yet. This is all new to us. We never asked for this kind of event to happen in our community. So how, how can we spread that out evenly is, is a good question. Like it deals with mental health, it deals with all the trauma. Like even me, for instance, like I, I never asked for any help. Come, look, come and see. But others do need help. I have five in the neck here. And I have one in the arm and one under here. Haley Sanderson was stabbed seven times by Miles Sanderson, no relation, who also attacked her husband, killed her dad, and her dad's girlfriend. I blamed myself for a long time, like, that I couldn't help my dad more. After the rampage was over, she tried to return to work, but it was overwhelming. Okay, I used to be very social and outgoing and everything, but I just can't be around people anymore. She doesn't know what she's going to do to support her family. I wasn't one to ask for help, and um, sometimes I'd have to get my mom to buy us groceries, or and my bills all piled up, and the more than $125,000 raised in the GoFundMe campaign created by former Conservative MP Rob Clark on behalf of James Smith are all sitting in a trust account run by the chief's lawyer, Robert Karras. These funds were not donated for the purpose of helping families meet and make ends meet. It was donated for the purpose of making sure that people are getting the counseling mental health, emotional, spiritual counseling that they need. He says the plan is to transfer the money to James Smith's health clinic, but only after it signs an agreement with the band in writing. If the funds cannot, for some reason, be applied in a, a way consistent with 
the the purpose of the donations, then the goal will absolutely be to provide those funds back to the donors through GoFundMe. We would have to send that money back to GoFundMe and have them reimburse everybody. Daryl Burns be, uh, hopes it doesn't come to that. I got to I got to look at them first. This one is lady. He says it's up to the community to make sure the donations make a difference. I feel like we're tasked with doing right with that money. It's up to us to show the way for the rest of Canada. Because if we fail, if we fail, the next community may not get that opportunity. You know, if this sort of thing happens in another community, like, they're going to say, well, look at James Smith. We gave him all that money and they failed. You know, so we have that responsibility to do right, not only for our people, but for the rest of the native country across Canada. In honor of the 11 lives lost, 17 injured, and all those still recovering. Olivia Stefanovic, CBC News, James Smith, Cree Nation. And Ethan is back with one last look at your weather. And we'll be starting a little bit cloudy in Regina tomorrow morning. Still a chance of some lingering showers at 8 a.m. We'll be well above the freezing mark, though, and I think we will get clearing pretty quickly as uh, we head through the morning hours to the noon hour. Already double digits by noon, but again, that wind out of the west still quite strong, around 50 kilometers an hour. Saskatoon, a little bit more sunshine for you tomorrow, though, around 4 degrees. Wind's still pretty strong out of the west, and that'll continue to be a theme as we head through the afternoon. But pure sunny skies and also 11 degrees. Been a long time since we've uh, seen some cute animals on our show, so here's a nice mink looking out for you, uh, by, uh, taken by C.J. Lassard up in Prince Albert National Park. Finally awake and finally welcoming those warm temperatures, Sam. Adorable. Thanks, Ethan. You bet. <laughs> And before we leave you, it's been nearly a week since that spring storm blasted through Saskatchewan. And while the snow is almost gone, two teachers say they will never forget how the storm brought their schools together. Last Thursday, Craig School welcomed a busload of high school students from Oak Bank, Manitoba. They were traveling home from a band trip in Alberta and were forced to seek shelter in the storm. The community fed the 50 visitors supper and breakfast, and the Manitoba students returned the favor by giving musical performances and helping tutor the elementary kids. Teachers say they all got some life lessons out of this experience. There's no other option. You make it work because that's what you do. That's just how I was born and raised, and that's how our communities work. I would never even think that you could turn somebody away. That didn't even cross my mind. That We can see that on both sides of the coin, where the folks in Craig and the folks that were on that bus did their best to serve one another. And I hope that that lesson gets carried forward, because if we can take that out into the world after we graduate, and understanding that service is one of the greatest callings, that um, maybe the world will be just a little bit better. Both principals say they hope to keep up the relationship between their schools and next year the Manitoba students plan to stop in Crake again, this time on purpose for a band concert. And before we go, the Moose Jaw Warriors season ended last night with an 8-2 loss to the Winnipeg Ice. The Saskatoon Blades are in another game seven tonight at Saskatel Centre as they take on the Red Deer Rebels. Ethan will have more on that later tonight at 11. That is it for us tonight. You can find more on our website and always on our YouTube channel. We're back tomorrow at 7.30 after hockey. Thanks for watching and have a great night.